Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing on this Palm Sunday? Big day in the life of the church always. Love seeing the kids with the palms, especially the wee, the wee, wee, tiny ones. Well, oh my goodness, do we have a donut emergency? Not an emergency. Okay. We're a month ahead. Okay. But if you'll let them know, I'm gonna start over here and just to pass it back. Okay. And we'll move it from section to section. Okay, so Sean has come up with a new plan for the donut board. He's going to start it over here. All you have to do is move it back, and Sean is going to move, or Kathy, is going to move it from section to section to section to section. The red boxes are out here. Please fill those out. Move those to the back. There's four of those. And the Joys of Concern notebooks as well. And Patty will lift up prayers at the end of the class. So, you know, as I was saying, it's Palm Sunday. I love all the l little ones. And I get a big charge out of the boys who are getting to the age where they're thinking, I maybe don't want to do this anymore, right? They got this, they're not sure what expression to have on their face. They're not sure what expression they want to have on their face, which is exactly how I felt in the checkout line at ATB yesterday. For those of you who saw, we're, we're in here, I'm not happy because all the cash registers are down at ATB. And we're standing in line with about a thousand other people waiting to check out. Have you seen the size of the baskets they have at that place? <laughs> and some of them are just stuffed overflowing and they're in front of us. And oh, I wasn't happy. And so of course, Patty gets out her camera and she says, show me a face that matches how you feel. <laughs> and I did. I gave it my best. I said, okay, I'm going to be despondent right now. So, <laughs> yeah, but we, we did eventually get out of there with our groceries, right, dear? Um, Jack, I don't, do you have a green light? Okay. Then, here, blowing it and see. You just, it just. It just has to be pretty close okay. to your mouth. Yeah. It's working. Now. Okay. Thank you. Got it. Okay, great. So, um, anyway, I have several announcements, um, just some reminders and things to go over today before we turn it over to Patty here. So, first of all, no class next week. We never do class on Easter. It's just. You know, going to be a lot of people here next week, so none of the adult classes try to meet or anything like that. So next week, um, no class. Arthur did a good job of lifting up the stations of the cross at the 930 service, so just remember, that's a new thing. So we're really trying to emphasize it because this is year one for it, and um, it's starting today, and you basically need your, your cell phone and some earbuds, I guess. And you'll do it kind of like if you were getting a walking tour at a, at a museum, okay? So, and it starts outside the narthex, all right? So my Monday class remains online only. It will remain online only, but we are starting tomorrow, the Gospel of Mark. So I would love to have you come online. My, this is my Facebook ministry page, the same place that this class is streamed to, the same place my Tuesday class is streamed to, and you can join us live, or you can listen to the podcast, or you could watch it on YouTube, and all of those links and how to do that is all on every Friday update that I send out with the weekly background study. So it's easy, easy to... Um, Join us in this journey through the Gospel of Mark. I think it's going to be great. And uh, I'm with those who think that Mark, the Gospel of Mark, is basically Peter's eyewitness testimony that John Mark heard over and over and over and over again and then wrote down and created this Gospel. It was the first Gospel um, to be written probably in the mid-60s A.D. And uh, it's very action-oriented. No big, long blocks of teaching. Very action-oriented, plunges right into the good news, and off Mark goes. So, invite you to participate in that. When we reconvene here on April 16th, 
we're going to begin a new series because I saw a book by Michael Bird, who is an Australian bi biblical scholar. I just say Australian because he talks funny. Um, <laughs> but he's very well known. He's, a, he's, he's very orthodox and everything and an interesting, interesting man. But he wrote this book called Seven Things I Want Christians to Know About the Bible, or I Want to Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible. And I looked at, I looked, just opened the table of contents before I even bought the book or anything, and I said, oh, yeah, ding, 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 ding. Those, are, those would be good to be my seven. So that's what we're going to do. And I um, invite you, if you want to go deeper than we're going to be able to go in the series, that you pick up a copy. It's up on Amazon, that title, Michael Bird. Um, if you're a reader and would like to go a little deeper into it, it's a, it's a, it's a book written for lay people, obviously, um, but, um, but very helpful. I don't know why I put but there. Just, I mean, it's written for lay people, and it's very helpful. So, all right, now, and the mission baskets will come around in a second, and you know that the missions collection we make in this class, you all make in this class is, is very large and enables the class to do a lot of wonderful things administered by the missions committee whose chair is Rich Morgan, and, and I can't thank them enough for their service in this. Now, Gary Brooks came up to me before class, and he suggested I take a show of hands. So how many people in here have ever seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? I kind of think that if you haven't seen it, you must be from Mars or something. <laughs> but somewhere in your life, I mean, really. So, so then he said, ask him this question. How many people watched it last night? Oh, that... That five minutes while you're turning from game to game doesn't count? No. Yeah, part of it maybe. So the point being, what's the point, Gary? The point is to set chances. Uh, can I stop you? No. <laughs> So why does it cost so much to go to the Disney parks if Disney's making all that money off the movie? I don't know. That's my question. Okay. All right. So Patty, what do you have for us today, dear? Okay. Yes? Yes? We're having class at noon on Tuesday, Theodos Danewood's funeral is at 3 o'clock. So we're going to have class. We're going to finish at 1.15. We're going to scoot out of the room quickly so that they can get the room ready for the reception after the service, and the service will begin at 3 o'clock in the sanctuary for Theodos Danewood. Thank you for that reminder. Now, Patty? All righty. <laughs> I wasn't sure if my voice was going to come out or not. Um, well, at first I do have a request, please. I just got a little text from uh, Kay Richardson, and she asked me to remind everybody um, who's in this class, who might be 55 or older, to fill out the survey that was sent to them by email this week from the Second Act Ministry. Um, on it, there's just a little link you hit on, and it goes through a series of questions that you're basically just hitting yes or no or filling in what you like about the ministry so far. Um, it's been a fabulous first year. Um, I know many of you have gone to, I just wrote down a few of them, the Brain Seminar. We had 450 people, the Legacy Book. Um, many times we've had the police officer here, and he's coming again April 26th. You'll hear more about that. But that's going to be about your personal safety. You're out and you're nervous, and somebody's threatening you, or in any, 
and what do you do? And, and that's the one he's gonna do for us on Wednesday night, April 26th. But um, we do need to know what people want us to do next year. This, this year we kind of just did a lot of things that we thought would be interesting to a lot of people. Um, but this will give you a little voice, really, to just, just jot down in that questionnaire what kind of events you're looking for. Um, we are having another social event coming up also. It's gonna be a, a happy hour. Um, but please, just, just take a minute. It will only take you just truly a few minutes Did to y'all get the email? click on it. Yes. Okay. Yes. If you've already done it, thank you. But if not, if you wouldn't mind, that would be awesome. Um, Today is National Peanut Butter and Jelly Day. <laughs> and I, I just imagine peanut butter being around forever. But I, I read a little about it, and it was in <clears throat> a little more than 125 years ago. Um, Good Housekeeping in 1896 put out for the, they called them the homemakers, a suggestion to try putting peanuts in your meat grinder. And what would come out, try spreading it on a slice of bread. Isn't that wild? That, that, and now, I imagine this is like the National Peanut Butter Association or something. They estimate that all of us, from the time you're born until you graduate high school, unless you're allergic to them, you've eaten 2,000 PB&J sandwiches. I wow. don't know. That's a... That's every meal, practically. No. No. <laughs> it is also National Reconciliation Day, and it is World Autism Awareness Day. One question, Patty. Yes. Do we have a meat grinder? No. No. <laughs> Hence, why were we in H-E-B? Anyway. I don't know. I do so. have a whole bunch of Pampered Chef things that I thought were really cool at parties and they never come out of the box, so. <laughs> I should bring them in and let people <laughs> have them. Okay, thank you, Patty. So let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here. It's Palm Sunday, big day, joyful days, a day of celebration and, and uh, um, uh, just, uh, May your spirit move among us, um, fill us with lots of energy, enthusiasm, discernment as we step through the weeks of the days of Holy Week. Um, for it begins Palm Sunday, but quickly turns dark and we're, we're inclined sometimes to race from Palm Sunday to Easter. Um, such a mistake. So as we, as we step through this this week, day by day, just uh, encourage us, help us to understand, help us to understand the price paid for our salvation. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what we're going to do, like I said, we're going we're gonna to step through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, not much happens on Saturday and Sunday of, of Holy Week. And the way, you know, you have to pick a gospel to do this with because they don't match up exactly, um, particularly John, of course, is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but what, um, our, my framework here is Mark's gospel. I'm about to start teaching it tomorrow. Um, all the pieces are there, even if they don't all line up exactly, because every, uh, every gospel writer writes for his own purpose. So let's get a, handle, a quick handle on the geography. This is the Israel of Jesus' day. Jews live in Galilee in the north. That's where Nazareth is. Those Jews tend to be more devout, by and large. It's also the place where you would be more inclined to find Jewish rebels who were ready to take up arms against the Romans because it was, you know, some distance away from Jerusalem and even away from the coastline where the Romans had a big porch and, and the governor would usually stay. Samaria is not Jewish. And then you come down to the south in Judea, and that is, of course, Jewish. Um, but there were a lot of 
Greek type cities and stuff spread around in that area, so it wasn't completely uh, Jewish. Jesus' hometown in Nazareth was about four miles, less, a little bit less than four miles from a city called Sepphoris. Um, just, uh, it, it's a more cosmopolitan area that, than you are inclined to think. And this is the route that Jews from Galilee would tend to take in order to come down to Jerusalem for Passover. Passover was every spring. Passover was a freedom festival. It, it remembered and commemorated and in a sense recreated the, the flight from Egypt, which was a flight from slavery to Pharaoh. And Jews were expected to, Jewish men in particular, were expected to be in Jerusalem for Passover as they were expected to be in Jerusalem for um, Pentecost and as they were expected to be in Jerusalem in the fall for tabernacles. And oftentimes families would come uh, during these times in order to make the trip down. And they went this route because they wanted to avoid the Samaritans, basically. And so they came down the eastern side of the Jordan River. Um, there were some Jews who lived along there, um, even though that side of the Jordan River was largely Gentiles. They'd come down the eastern side. They would come down to Jericho, which you've heard of, and there they would begin the climb up to Jerusalem because Jericho's about 800 feet below sea level. Jerusalem's about 2,400 feet above sea level. So it's a pretty, pretty long climb up. Now this is a, a photo of Jerusalem today taken from the west looking toward the east, okay? So it's sort of like your helicopter was over the Mediterranean and had a big gold lens that could do all of this. And you're looking out, you've got um, uh, the Jordan River emptying into the Dead Sea there. And let's see if I have... Oh, I see what the slides want to do. Okay, so that is the Judean wilderness there, the Dead Sea. The Mount of Olives and the temple, the Dome of the Rock there. That, see that little rectangular area there? That is still there today. It was the te huge temple mount that Herod built. And where you see that, if you can, that little golden dome, that is where the great temple stood in Jesus' day. And finally, we have um, Jericho off there in the distance. So you see where the Mount of Olives is? Um, Arthur today mentioned Bethphage and Bethany. Those are villages on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. And that will factor into the story because Jesus comes um, riding into Jerusalem from which direction? He comes from the east into the city because that was the Jewish expectation for how the Messiah would enter Jerusalem. And he's met by the crowds and they escort him into the city because that's how kings were um, uh, welcomed. You would meet the arriving king or the arriving conqueror outside the city walls and you would bring them into the city as a way of acknowledging that you are their subjects, that they are the king and sort of you are not. Okay? So this is the Judean wilderness. You often hear stories about the wilderness in, in the New Testament. Um, I just brought this so you could see that I'm not crazy when I call it a moonscape. There is really, there's really nothing there. There's a few things there now, um, a road or two, <coughs> a couple of camps and Tourist spots along the Dead Sea, maybe a restaurant to serve tourists, maybe some old guy that's got a camel he wants you to ride. You know, that's, that's about it. There just isn't much there. there and, and there are places where there, you can't, couldn't put anything. Couldn't put it. It's just so desolate. Just so desolate. And Arthur today made the point that Jesus, you know, when he comes on Palm Sunday, you know, he could have escaped all that lay, lay ahead for him. 
He could have escaped over the Mount of Olives and run down into the Judean wilderness. Nobody would find him there. It's full of caves. You could hide there. That's what David does with Saul. David, you could hide there forever. How would they find you? So the geography matters to the story. It, of course it matters to the story. Geography matters to your life, to my life today. Of course it matters to, to the events that happened then. So, as I said before, where the Dome of the Rock is, that was a built about 700, 750 A.D., right in there, uh, by the Muslims, where that stand, where you see that golden dome, that's where Herod's temple was. That's where the temple was built. Now, the temple in Jesus' day was twice the height of the Dome of the Rock. So it was a very imposing structure. So when Jesus is riding in from the east, approaching the city, it just dominates the landscape. Um, okay? I don't know what that's all about. I don't know. That's weird. I need to remember to turn animation off on these slides. There's so many things to think about. Okay, this is a slide of Jerusalem in Jesus' day, okay? Um, a rough outline of it. I like it because it's nice and simple, you know, and black and white, and I can trace things easily. You see the Mount of Olives. That's this um, sort of a ridge almost. Um, it's not much of a mountain, but it is elevated. And down in the valley, between the Mount of Olives and the eastern wall, if you're still with me, there's the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus would ride in from Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives in order to come to Jerusalem for Palm Sunday or other days. You could always come in that way if, if, if you wish to. And um, up at the top, I circled the Antonia Fortress. That is a Roman fortress. It's where Roman legionnaires were stationed overlooking the temple courtyards because it was a place of such trouble. Especially when everybody is arriving and the city's getting packed for Passover. Um, just, just so many people, they're there to celebrate their freedom from Pharaoh and they look up and who do they see? Those hated Roman soldiers. Herod's palace is on an elevated section on the western side of the city. The rich people tended to live in the elevated parts where it smelled better. Um, and that's the house of Caiaphas. Also, he's a celebrity of the day. That's probably um, Caiaphas' house there also on the western side of the city. This is a model of um, Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And... We have a small version of it um, uh, put together and donated by the 2011 Israel trip group that sits, I think it's still outside the library, and it's, it sort of looks like this because there, this model is huge. It's outdoors, um, but it gives you, a, in Jerusalem, it gives you a really good perspective on the city that Jesus entered on Palm Sunday and explains things like Jesus went into the temple or went into the temple courtyards. What are we talking about? So here is the Temple Mount. It's huge. I've been up there twice. It's huge. Um, you could fit 22, 23, 24 football fields in it. It's that large. When you stand down at one end, it's a long way to look down to the other end. Now, Jesus would have entered from the east. That's over there by the park bench. <laughs> the park bench is sort of the Mount of Olives, okay? The temple courtyards are those open areas on the Temple Mount, surrounded on three sides by porticos, okay? Porticos are just, they're just these pillared root covered areas because sometimes the sun there is just, it melts your brain. Um, and so, of course, they appreciate its side. This larger portico is called Solomon's Portico, um, but there under the porticos, out in the courtyards, that's where all of the action was. That's where the money changers and those who would be selling animals 
um, for the purpose of sacrifice, that's where they would all set up and be conducting, be conducting their business. Okay? To orient you just a bit, if you go to uh, Jerusalem, the white arrow is pointing to what we know as the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. And it is a place where Jews and Christians can go up and put their hands on the foundation of the Temple Mount that was there in Jesus' day. Okay? So it's a very significant place, particularly in Judaism, because they want to get as close to the place where the temple stood as possible. To do that, they have to do it along the foundation at the bottom of the wall because they are not allowed up on the top because that's under it's I, it's Israeli security with Muslim security, but basically is under the control of the, of the Palestinians. So Jews don't go up there and you know, to try to, I think, avoid, avoid trouble. So, um, I think I have another arrow. Okay, that's the Antonio Fortress on the north side there. You can see how the parapets and things are places where the soldiers could stand to look down um, into the temple courtyards. Now, you, you may think, well, okay, Scott, what does this have to do with anything? It's, it's not a peaceful place at Pass out, Passover. It's a violent place at Passover, right? And the Romans, the pagan oppressors, the ones who the people thought the Messiah would get rid of, they're just right there, okay? Emphasizing that they are in control. So there is the temple again. Um, there are, the way the temple worked was, um, the only people who could enter, Gentiles could get into the temple courtyards. Only Jews could get into the temple proper, and women could only go so far in that, and then it's only men only, and then it's only priests, then it's priests only. It's just, it kind of worked similar to the way the Israeli, I, Israelite camps worked, but, but, and so there are uh, Gentile courtyards, women courtyards, and things but that is the, the big, tall building. That is the temple proper. And in that was the curtain that you've read about. Um, but they don't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore. You see, it should be in there, but it's not in there because it was lost to the Babylonians almost 600 years before Jesus. So, all right. So this is just another shot. See, it's just a wonderful model. I mean, really, the thing is huge. It's this, these photos were taken when it was at a hotel, but now it's at the Israel Museum. And I, whenever I take groups to Israel, I always want to stop there. So you can really get a sense of what Jerusalem was like in Jesus' day. Okay, so um, there we go. There's that one again. And... Okay, we squared away. Jerusalem, the time bomb. It's packed with Jews who have come to celebrate freedom. Freedom from slavery to Pharaoh. 200,000 or more in and around the city. You know, there's not room in the city for all of them. There's certainly not room for all of them to sleep. So, not, you know, so people are staying in places like Bethany where where Jesus stays with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Every year at Passover, there was trouble, and the Romans had zero tolerance for it. It's sort of the idea that, you know, if you get a little spark, you need to stamp that little spark out right away before it blooms into a fire. By the time Jesus arrives on the scene, it, the fires are blooming more and more and more, and there's more and more trouble. The Romans would sometimes ride their horses up into the temple courtyards to try to keep peace and put down trouble. And you can imagine the kind of confrontations there were. 20 years after Jesus, 30,000 Jews were killed during Passover because the revolutionary fervor in Israel was growing, 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 and would reach its climax in the 60s AD, about a little more, about 35 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, 35 years ago was about 1980 in our terms. 
Seems like yesterday to me. Really, it's not very long. To go from Jesus' death and resurrection to the, to the time bomb exploding. So when Jesus arrives on Palm Sunday, wrapping himself, as I said before, right in the little context piece I did before the 930 service, when Jesus arrives, it's, it's hot. You could feel the tension in the air, the heat in the air, and here comes Jesus riding in as king. Now, I'm often asked, well, how big are the crowds that are welcoming Jesus? They're probably pretty small. Now, why would I say that? Because if they were huge crowds, if the whole city was actually turning out to welcome Jesus as a king, the Romans would have put an end to it on Sunday. You'd never have gotten to Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday of, of, of Holy Week. So the crowds, but they're enthusiastic. They're enthusiastic, and they welcome Jesus, they bring him in, and he wraps air. All of these things that I listed are all symbols, right, of Messiah from the Old Testament or the way kings were treated when they arrived at cities, meeting him outside the city, coming in. Eastern gate, coming in. Palm branches, cloaks laid out, riding that donkey. The, the foal of a donkey, a young donkey, such a humble ride. If you're wondering, <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I gave my little context bit in the service, I said, you know, kings and conquerors ride horse, mighty steeds, horses with names like Shadowfax. Anybody know what horse was Shadowfax? No. Okay, there's a few. Yes, Arthur did that in The Lord of the Rings, that's Gandalf's horse. Yeah, you see, there we go. I did that for Arthur. Okay, they shout hosannas, right? It's a big day. What you need to carry away from Palm Sunday is one thing. That Jesus, what did he do? It's like, he, it, it's like um, any, any secrecy, anything like, when, remember when he tells his mom in Cana, oh, no, don't, it's not my time, it's not my time. My hour has not yet come. When he heals Jews and stuff, he says, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. He's trying to keep some control over that ministry so that it has a chance to play out. But that all comes to an end on this Palm Sunday, the last Sunday before the Passover. Now, it's not a Sabbath, right? Right. right? It's the day after Sabbath. He arrives on that Sunday. And he, everybody, every Jew would understand exactly what was happening with Jesus. They might not agree, okay? They might not see Jesus that way. Most likely what the result of it was that their expectations of the Messiah came to the forefront. And um, there were basically two pieces to the, to the Messiah's job description. The Messiah, this kingly figure, this king from the house of David, was to conquer the Romans, get those pagan oppressors off the land, and clean up the temple, get rid of the wicked priests, because the, the priestly system had become utterly corrupt, and everybody knew it. So that's how the people tended to see the work the Messiah would do. So they expected the Messiah to arrive in wonder and might and power and glory for everybody to see. There's enough hints of that on Sunday, but what happens as the week goes along? It becomes very clear to them that, that that's not Jesus. That's not who the Messiah is. He hasn't come to make war. He has come to be faithful to God, as he has been faithful to God his entire life. So, after Jesus enters into Jerusalem and the crowds, and he's welcomed, he, they, he goes back outside the city, presumably back out to Bethany, where he will spend the night. Like I said, it's a very, very busy place, and he will return on Monday. Now, Monday has this funny story about him cursing a fig tree. Why curse a fig tree? I mean, 
I'll grant you, I've been to that part of the world several times. I'm not real big on just like grabbing a fig. For me, a fig is supposed to be mashed, wrapped in a certain type of cookie, <laughs> right? Then sliced and put inside plastic. A fig Newton is as close as I want to get to a fig. Some, some of you may just love eating figs. Wonderful. That's great. I'm all for you. But I'm not. So, but the thing is, the fig tree was a symbol of the temple. Right? The symbol of the temple. It's, it's, not, it's not terribly complicated. It's a symbol of the temple. And then Jesus goes into the temple, makes his way up into those temple courtyards that I showed you, right? And then he interrupts the business in those temple courtyards. The business. People coming for Passover were supposed to have, make sacrifices. There were various kinds of sacrifices. You, you, you would sacrifice an animal or a bird or other things depending on like the birth of a child, that sort of thing. But you might not want to carry all, that, all those animals from Galilee. So you would bring, you know, a few coins with you and you would come to Jerusalem and you would go into the temple courtyards and you would buy the animal that you needed to offer as a sacrifice. And you'd go, then go do, the man, the husband would go do that work in the, in the temple. Now, that whole enterprise of the money changers and the selling of these animals is what Jesus interrupts. I don't know how long he interrupts it. 30 minutes, an hour. You know they're anxious to get it started again. What you need to connect it to, in a connecting the dot sense, is to the prophet Jeremiah, who about 600 years before Jesus went into the, the Solomon's temple is still standing, and he went into the temple gates, and he stood there and he said, to the people, you can't come to this temple and just simply say, this is the temple of the Lord, this is the temple of the Lord, this is the temple of the Lord, and ignore the poor and the oppressed, the widows and the orphans. You can't do that. You've taken God's house and turned it into a den of thieves. And those are the words Jesus invokes on Monday. Those are the, it's Jeremiah's actions that Jesus invokes. And indeed, just as a few decades after Jeremiah, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, so just a few decades after Jesus, the temple will be destroyed by the Romans. Jeremiah pronounced God's judgment on the temple, Jesus pronounces God's judgment on the temple. The, the priestly system has become corrupted and is leading the people away from God rather than toward God, which all the bad kings of Israel and Judea do. They lead the people away from God rather than toward God. So, well, you can imagine, of course the leadership plots against Jesus. That's no surprise. You know, I, I, I sometimes wonder if they, were, if they really wanted to insist that he be dead, would they have been just as happy if he shipped off to Iceland or something, you know? Maybe, but, but they want rid of him. They want rid of him. The people are paying attention to him, and he is pronouncing judgment on the temple from which they are constructing dynasties and great wealth, these priests are. So, on that Tuesday, when all that's done, all that action, Jesus heads back out to Bethany, where he's going to spend the night to bring us to Tuesday. Now, Tuesday is a very momentous day. Momentous. Mark, like the other Gospels, collect all these confrontations that people have with Jesus. They want to confront him. They want to trap him. The leadership wants to turn the people against Jesus. 
That's what all these scenarios are about. G they'd want to trap Jesus on the issue of marriage and they want to trap Jesus on the issue of taxes because that tends to get the Jews trapped quite a bit. They want to trap Jesus on the business of taxes. Um, And then you have these wonderful moments, the widow's offering, right, that Jesus uses as a teaching point, the widow's, the widow's might. Jesus, is te Jesus tells a parable um, about wicked tenants in the vineyard who kill even the son of the vineyard owner. So it's a very confrontational day. That's, what you just, that's, that, that's sort of the bottom line for Tuesday. Tuesday's just packed with confrontations all day long and a few bright flowers sort of coming up out of the confrontations. But the confrontations added to the cleansing of the temple, Jesus invoking Jeremiah on Monday tells you what? That boy, it's just being wound tighter and tighter and tighter, right? And does Jesus run? Does he escape? Does he head, say, I'm going back to Galilee now, guys, or I'm going to head over the Mount of Olives and I'll see you in a few months after things cool down? Nope, nope. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, Tuesday continued. <laughs> One more piece on Tuesday. I forgot about it in my excitement here. Okay, so at the end of Tuesday in Mark's gospel, what happens is he he he's they le they're leaving the um, temple, he his, disi his disciples, and they're all agog. They're all agog at the sheer splendor of it because they're country guys, right? They like country music. They're country guys. They're country guys. And they're just, wow, look at the big city. Look at all this stuff. And Jesus says it's all going to be turned, pulled down one stone on top of another. And, of course, it seems impossible. And then Jesus takes them up, and they sit on the Mount of Olives. Now, if you sit on the Mount of Olives, you can and look right down. That is the Mount of Olives, and when you sit up there, you can look right down onto the Dome of the Rock. That photo was taken from the Mount of Olives. So you can see the Herod's Temple is standing where the Dome of the Rock is, right there. You can see all the temple courtyards with the beautiful porticos and the rest of it. And Jesus talks to them about what is coming. That God's judgment has been rendered. Has been rendered. And the temple is not going to stand, and it's going to be bad. Bad, bad. As it would be 35 years later when the Romans come to um, Judea and Galilee to put down a revolt by the Jews. And they destroy the temple. And tens of thousands of Jews are killed, and their bodies are piled into the garbage heap on the south side of the city. It's terrible. All of that. We come to Wednesday. The temple leaders now plot to arrest and kill Jesus. Of course they do. Um, you know, he, he's pronounced God's, God's judgment on the temple, but now the priests are going to lay their own judgment upon Jesus. He predicted, Jesus told them that the death of the temple is coming, and now the leaders are going to put Jesus to death. He stays in Bethany on Wednesday, and in Mark's gospel, that is where a woman comes forward and anoints him with the expensive ointment and stuff. And here's the clue to this little story that you've probably heard your whole life in various forms. She's anointing him for burial. That's it. That's, that, that's how you have to think about this story of the ointment. He, they aren't going to have Jesus with them much longer. He's being anointed for burial because when when they buried bodies, they would, they would put, pack the bodies as best they could afford with various spices and oils and other things in order to try to keep down the smell. And so she is anointing him for burial when she comes to him on that Wednesday. 
and that is what drives Judas to go to the temple priests and prepare to turn Jesus over to them. Okay? Thursday. They get up Thursday. They're going to come into the city. They're going to do this Passover meal. It's supposed to happen with inside. They're all supposed to take the meal within the city walls. Do we really know where this happened? No, we really don't. There is a place in Jerusalem called the Upper Room, but it's only, it really only goes back to about the time of the Crusaders. There isn't really any good link from that place to this event um, a thousand years before the Crusaders. All right? So, um, how to see this? Jesus take, remember Passover is about celebrating the exodus from Egypt, freedom from slavery. So what Jesus does is he takes this meal and he reshapes it around himself. It is his blood. Remember in, 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 in Exodus 12, you may know that the blood of the lamb was spread on the doorway, right? It's Jesus' blood that will be shed. In the Passover, the um, lamb's bones were broken. Now it will be the Jesus' body will be broken, right? My blood, my body, Jesus says. So he takes this exodus and he, and he reshapes it around himself as a new exodus. Not merely freedom from Pharaoh, not merely freedom from slavery to anyone, but freedom from slavery to sin and death. And it is why, though we Christians can certainly participate in in a Jewish Seder, a Jewish Passover, a Jewish Passover and Holy Communion are not the same thing. Passover is not merely a Christian version of, of what the Jews do. It's reshaped, it's reconfigured by Jesus to be around Jesus. Everything's around Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. It's always about the who. Do you ever get lost in the Bible or theology, think about the who. It's the who. It's Jesus. And after this Last Supper, he goes to the Garden Gethsemane and he prays. And he prays for another way forward. Of course he does. Of course he does. Anybody would. Crucifixion was the most horrific, humiliating execution that the Romans had to to inflict on anyone. Of course he wants another way forward, but he, he will stay faithful to God, and he will not escape, he will not run away, he won't head back to Galilee, he won't run to the other side of the Mount of Olives, he will stay, he will be faithful, he will be obedient, even to death, death on a cross, as Paul writes. But he just, don't, Sometimes I find people, they want to take this away from Jesus. They want to say, well, does he know what's going to happen? And so what's the kind of, what's the big, big deal? He's going to be resurrected in a few days. Don't take this away from Jesus. None of you would want to be crucified. I would not want to be crucified. I would not want any of you to be crucified. A much healthier way to think about it is, oh, my, I, I wouldn't have my sons crucified for anybody. I love you guys, but... But God gave over his own son to be crucified for you and me. So, so don't take the Garden of Gethsemane away from Jesus. He doesn't, want, he doesn't want what comes on Friday. He's willing, he's obedient, but he doesn't want it. So Jesus is going to go stand trial before um, Caiaphas and Pilate, and I don't have time to go into great de- detail about all of this, but um, you know, I'm sometimes asked about Pilate because he seems kind of conflicted in this. The conflict is not his concern about one innocent man dying. That might be somebody's concern today, but we have 2,000 years of the Christian ethic behind us. <laughs> These were people who would go to arenas to watch humans get killed. 
in the first 90 days of the Colosseum opening in Rome, the big one, the one some of you have been to, it's estimated there were 10,000 people killed. So, an innocent death. That's, Pilate was even kind of, he was a pretty bad guy. Twice he was called back to, to Rome um, for being too tough on the Jews. So that's not it. What is it? What's going on with Pilate's conflict in this? He is, he just doesn't want to do what the priests want him to do. He's been, in, he's been confronting them since the time he arrived. They have a contentious relationship and he just doesn't want to do what they want him to do. But he knows he must because he can't have somebody send word back to Rome that he let this, who? King of the Jews? Go. There's only one king in the Roman Empire. Who is that king? Caesar. You've got it. It's Caesar. For Caiaphas's part, I am inclined to give Caiaphas I think Caiaphas understands what's happening. And I do think he is actually shocked when Jesus actually says, I am, to the question of whether he is the Messiah. And then gives to Caiaphas these two, woven together, two messianic passages from Psalm 110 and Daniel 7. And... And I think Caiaphas is shocked, and so he stands up and he tears his, his, his robe, but sure. The priests want Jesus gone, they want him dead, and they're going to make the Romans um, do it for him. So, um, Jesus then is crucified on, on, on Friday. And in, like we talked about last week, the cross is the place of our atonement, our being put at one with God, at one with God. Um, the crucifixion happens um, just outside the city. Just, here's, I got a, here's a picture of the model. I put a little circle, I hope it's there, uh, an arrow uh, pointing to the place where the crucifixion happened. Um, and they would do, the Romans would do it on a busy thoroughfare right outside the city walls. Why would they do that? Because this is supposed to be an example to people. This is what's going to happen to you if you stand up to Rome. So they're not going to take Jesus four miles out of town where nobody can see. Everybody's supposed to see what happens when you stand up to Rome. And so Jesus is crucified there. And Constantine's mother visits the Holy Land a few hundred years later, and she asks, well, where did this happen? And they take her and they show what happened here. And she built a church there. And over the centuries, that church has become the, well, the bizarre architectural <laughs> buildings called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And, that, and it's on that spot where Jesus is crucified. It's on that spot that Jesus' body is taken down from the cross before sundown on Friday before sundown on the because the Sabbath begins and nobody could handle dead bodies on the Sabbath so they have to hurry right and they take the body and they gonna take Jesus's body and lay it in a tomb that belongs to a man named Joseph of Arimathea all four gospels agree that it's a tomb belonging to a prominent person on the Jewish high council on the Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea it's one of the best evidences that this is so that it's true and their, and their process of burial was to allow a person to lay in a tomb until their flesh had decomposed, and then the, bo then the bones would be collected and put into a bone box, like this one. This is Caiaphas's bone box, found about now, maybe 45 years ago. Uh, most bone boxes didn't look like that. Caiaphas was a rich man, so it was all ornate and everything like that. Most bone boxes look like this. And that's where most Jewish bones, for the period of maybe 150 years before Jesus to about 70 years after, that's how they did it. They didn't bury people in the ground. 
they put them in these tombs. Here's the Herod family tomb with the rolling stone. Why is the, why is the stone roll? So that they can roll the stone in front of the entrance, keep animals out, and then roll it back when they have to go in and tend to one of the bodies because the tombs would be used for multiple people. Your whole family would be there and a, after they died, okay? <laughs> in varying states of decomposition. So you would be going in and out from time to time. So the stones were round and you could, you could, they would move back and forth. And inside, now this is a fancy one again. This is much fancier than most of them were. This is this, uh, pretty sure this is from inside the Herod family tomb. There were, that's where a body would land, uh, that little niche there, all wrapped up and that have the, you know, all the things you read about in scripture where it got the spices and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the little connection, when you read how much was given by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus for Jesus, it's an enormous sum. It's a sum fit enough for a king. That, that, that's the key. It's a sum fit enough for a king. The idea being that Jesus' body would lay there wrapped up and then they would come back at some future time and collect the bones and put them in a bone box. Now they can't finish all of this work on Friday so the women are coming back there Sunday morning to finish it all up and of course it's women because this is nasty kind of stuff and they would leave it to the women to do. It's a very patriarchal world. But what, what do they discover when they, when they come? That the tomb is empty for Jesus has been raised. Jesus has been resurrected and that has changed everything everything nothing in this world is the same on this side of Jesus's death and resurrection as on the before side of Jesus's death and resurrection and we are privileged to live on this side of Jesus's death and resurrection we know what God has done we know what God is doing we know what God will do it's the, mo it's the most momentous event in human history. And it did happen almost 2,000 years ago. It's not anything that happened t a decade ago or two decades ago. We want to imagine we live in the most momentous times. If they're, they're not. They're not. They're not even the most troubled times. These are pretty darn good times, actually, in the large scheme of human history. It is Jesus' death and resurrection. So when you come to, as we embark on, on Holy Week, I invite you to read Mark's narrative of that week, read Matthew's, read Luke's, read John's. John's is very different. John, John writes for his purposes. Um, and, and come to a, deep, a deeper sense of what is happening as Jesus moves in obedience all the way to the cross and is then resurrected. So I see, I went all the way to noon today. So I imagine Patty has the prayers. Yes. So if you have questions that you would like to ask me, you can come up to me after class. But I, I don't want to go way over today. So I will go over, turn it over to Patty now. And just another reminder about the Stations, stations of the Cross. Stations of the Cross, 14 stations, very traditional, will walk you through um, events of that week, particularly what happens on um, Thursday night and Friday. Mm -hmm. Lauren wrote it all. She did a really outstanding job on all of it. Okay, here's our prayers for today. Prayers for a friend, Gloria Miller, who is having a hip replacement surgery tomorrow. Um, prayers from a woman in our class for her surgery this Thursday morning. It will be the third surgery to get clean margins. So let's really pray for that one, for all of them, of course. Prayer requests for health for Scott Walken, who needs a heart transplant. Prayers for my husband and his daughter and son in the death of his ex-wife and their mother. And that came from Lisa. Continued prayers of comfort for Laura Sturzing. This is Kathy's friend who is suffering with pancreatic cancer. Um, got a lot here from Mike Kelly. 
uh, his sister-in-law has returned safely from her, her 2,000 mile trip and he appreciated all the prayers. Continued prayers for one of his classmates, Melvin, battling cancer. Prayers for all the victims of all the tornadoes in the Southwest and Midwest with over 22 killed. Prayers for Pope Francis recovering from an upper respiratory infection. Prayers for the family of the following U.S. Army soldiers killed in a helicopter crash. Marie Bolanis, Zach Esperanza, Esperanza, Jeff Barnes, Isaac John, I believe it's Gaxo, uh, Joshua Gore, Aaron Healy, Taylor Mitchell, Rustin Smith, and David Solinas. Continued prayers for all those affected by the shooting this week in Nashville. Continued prayers for Doug Damewood and his family in the death of his wife, Theodis. And again, that service will be in the sanctuary three o'clock this Tuesday. Prayers for our friend George, who was in a nursing home following breaking his pelvis. Prayers for friend Michael, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Prayers for my family friend who is losing um, her battle with breast cancer. And this is the family of Dawn Smith. Prayers of thanksgiving for my teacher friend who was given a clean bill of health and will be back to work two weeks early. So that's a lot of prayers for healing today, a lot. And uh, if you would just go to the Lord in prayer with me. Holy Father, we lift up to you today so many people who are suffering right now with cancer and other illnesses, awaiting surgeries, and we're praying God for just good results, Lord, from all these surgeries and complete recoveries. We pray, God, that you would help us to keep you in our mind every day this week as we approach the week up until your death and resurrection, Lord. We are so grateful, God, to be in a place where we can share our joys, our concerns, and we can share and worship with each other. We love you, Lord. Please bring us back safely together next Sunday. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So have a very adios and have a very blessed Holy Week.